Hello everyone, welcome back. This is lecture 11. We're going to introduce some of the learning paradigms today. More specifically, we're going to introduce multitask learning and shot learning with the few shot learning and the zero shot learning as examples. And in between, we're going to introduce the idea of transfer learning, metric learning, and meta learning there. And we will also introduce the generative networks like the VAE and GAN. And we will introduce the reinforcement learning at the end. You might already heard the term learning a lot of times, either in this course or at somewhere else. However, the term is kind of overused in machine learning because it sometimes it means a specific model. Well, uh, sometimes it may referring to a framework or a specific task. Let's check out some examples. The first one we're going to introduce is the multitask learning. Here is a definition, however, it's a long sentence that you don't like. Let's speak in simple language. What we have been introduced so far are actually called single task learning. No matter you're doing classification, detection, or segmentation, it works like once you have a task, you have some training example there, and you train the model and use the model to do the prediction. Whenever you have a new task, you have to uh, read that process again using another set of training examples, train another model, and do another set of predictions there. Anyway, for each of the tasks, you have to repeat that process of learning. However, usually those tasks, those training data, assure something in common. So, is it possible to share the training in some sense? Actually, we can share the model, uh, we can share the training data there. That saves a lot of efforts. Here is another point of view, telling the same story in terms of neural networks. You will see here in single task learning, you have to go through that training using a set inputs going through that network and you have that result for a specific task there then you repeat that process those are independent to each other however in multitask learning uh, we probably we can share the same inputs uh, in that case we share the training data and at the same time we might share the model the neural network we don't have to build one neural network or one model specifically for a task. So what makes difference is at the final or uh, output layers, uh, we could make some specific layers for specific tasks there. You will see here, we share a lot here, we share a lot here. That's reduce our efforts for training. In terms of sharing the neural networks, we can do hard parameter sharing. That means we share the main body, the hidden layers of neural networks there. So the parameters inside will be shared among different tasks there. And the only difference from each of the tasks are those latter layers there, as I mentioned previously. Or we can go the soft parameter sharing. Um, in that case, we still keep the main body, uh, the hidden layers for each of the tasks. However, during the training, they're sharing some information in between using some constraint. Or simply speaking, when you're training this task, those parameters will pass information to its neighbors, tasks, and then uh, those already trained uh, experience or uh, knowledge will be passed to other tasks there and reduce their efforts of training it again and help them to converge um, more efficiently. 
Here is a more specific example for multitask learning where you could see here the input is an image and there are different tasks. Some of them trying to find the semantic information from that image. Another is trying to find the instances there. And also at the same time, there is one task specifically interested in the depths of that image because you can see uh, they actually share a lot of in common and they can be trained joined today. And in that case, we'll combine their loss into one loss called multitask loss there. And those efforts of training will be reduced. And those different tasks and different models actually can work together to make a better uh, prediction afterwards. In that example, we see the sharing of the loss and we also see the sharing of the input. That means the data. The reason is the deep models are usually hungry about data, but in reality, in a lot of applications there, we just have a limited number of data, especially those with the labels. To address that problem here, comes the end-shot learning. End-shot learning is trying to do the supervised learning with a limited number of training examples. And more specifically, there are actually few shot learning. That means you have only a few examples for training. One shot learning, you just have one single example for training or uh, available before you do, you're doing the prediction. And here are also, in some case, you don't exactly have any of the samples or uh, training examples before prediction. And here you could see the multitask learning is actually a framework and you can implement it, them in different way. However, the end shot learning is not exactly a framework. It's a task to address the problem. Let's take a look at a few shot learning. Uh, that actually means we have a few shots available and, and here's a term NWK shot classification, which means you have N classes to predict. That's actually the number of labels. And for each of them, there are key shots available for you. And at the runtime, here is a query set. Uh, given those query, you have to identify which those uh, queries are belonging to. That is to say, to give the predicted labels for each of those examples in a query set. After here, the future learning is a task or a problem to address. And the meta learning is a way to address that problem. And actually, meta learning is more like a framework. Sometimes, meta learning are called meta transfer learning. And there is a more general um, area called transfer learning, which is trying to reuse the knowledge or models you have gained at some of the domain. Uh, in the new domain. So you don't have to repeat the whole process of training, just maybe like fine tuning some parts of the parameters. That's it's a more general concept. And meta learning can be considered one of the examples of transfer learning. So meta learning sometimes called meta transfer learning in between. Let's see what the meta learning is. Meta learning divides that process of training and testing into separate stage. One is meta training, another is meta testing. You will see in meta testing that's exactly uh, the data uh, what we have presented at the very beginning of the few shot learning. You have a support set which is uh, n classes. Uh, over key shots 
for each of them there are key sets available and there is a query set and your job is trying to predict labels for examples and query sets however there is an additional base set uh, that means we as I have we have introduced a lot of times that there are some public available data sets in between you can find plenty of examples there and classes there as well you can actually reuse such kind of data sets for chain for example you can organize the data available in the same way as the support set even you might have a lot of examples in those data sets available but you can organize that way by picking up uh, key classes there and for each of them you can pick key shots there uh, uh, you, in that way you're organizing uh, when and we key shots a uh, problem a task for those existing data sets because you actually has a lot of them there uh, it can be reorganized it's better to use uh, plenty of data to organize tasks for uh, a few data tasks um, however not uh, vice versa so uh, anyway it's much easier once you're organized that way you can train and uh, as you required for that so you can train models here and uh, in a way that the model uh, is able to adjust the problem when there are n way k shots uh, available and it can predict um, uh, for a query set and those data in those data sets you can extract uh, query sets as well uh, anyway the model chain here with the largely available um, uh, data sets you can have a model which is capable for few shot learning of few shot problem then in the future this model can be used for the support set because it's really trained that way um, it's supposed to solve the problem of the few shot learning on the support sets um, and for the query set as well so that's the idea of meta learning okay meta learning is one solution for few shot problem there are some other later natives like the metric or contrastive learning um, in between this actually what we have introduced in the deep image retrieval uh, if you remember we're using two stream this is a uh, uh, siamese network um, uh, with two images as inputs at the end and the network is going to output a similarity between uh, those two images and the idea is we can um, actually embed those two images in an embedded space making those relevant images close to each other at the same time make the irrelevant pairs far from each other so that's is the idea because um, we're training a metric at the same time uh, the goal is making some contrast between the relevant uh, pairs uh, from the irrelevant pairs so this is what we have introduced before I'm not going to repeat them you can refer uh, to the deep image retrieval for more information beside the field shot learning there is zero shot learning and it's a different task actually from few shot learning note i'm using the term different rather than a more challenging because it sounds like we just have we don't have any of those examples available uh, before we're making the prediction it sounds more challenging actually uh, i don't think so because um the problem is different it's trying to address the problem like when you're seeing this unsane picture you're trying to give its label it's a zebra here as well but however you never seen that uh, zebra however it doesn't mean you have no information about the zebra you could have that 
um, description of zebra. For example, you could prepare a lot of description about animals from uh, some of data source like Wikipedia. And you know um, those key information about zebra. Zebra is about a stripe. It's horse-like and it has that black and white patterns there. And those are some basic characteristics about the zebra. Those basic attributes act actually can be learned in advance because once, for example, you have a lot of same classes, uh, you have the images for them and at the same time you have the description for each of them as well. You can also extract this information for different animals from something like the Wikipedia from the WordNet. So you can use that kind of association between those attributes and those images there to train your model to build the association between those key characteristics uh, or description um, and the patterns. So those different patterns or features can be associated back to those attributes and then your model knows, knows that. Then in the future, even you haven't seen and zebra, but those basic attributes will tell you the characteristics about this um, image. Then it can be associated back to the basic attribute and using that basic attribute as a bridge, you know it's probably a zebra. This is how every um, how everything works out. Here you might have realized something like so far we're trying to discriminate things. Uh, we're trying to make prediction for classes there. However, in zero shot learning, we're actually start to generate something. That is, we're generate the attributes for unseen classes there. Um, it's kind of different from those discriminative um, models. Indeed, people have names for those two groups of training or two groups of learning. Um, respectively, that is generative learning or discriminative learning or sometimes the result is called generative models and discriminative models there. The generative way is trying to build up a knowledge about different classes. However, in discriminative models, we're just trying to tell the difference. We, we are simply speaking in a discriminative, um, we are just telling information like it's some of the class because they are not the other classes there because uh, there are uh, different. It's different from other classes there. And this is discriminative way uh, to do the prediction. However, in generative way, we build the characteristics for each of the classes. We are trying to model what it will be look like, what their features will be. Then we can use that information to tell um, in the future those unseen classes by matching them back uh, about what, what they are. So we can tell. Uh, it, we have to model, anyway, we have to model specifically uh, their nature or their feature where not just tell the difference uh, among classes. However, we actually have some models that are more generative and I'm not gonna uh, confuse you. Those generative models are different from what I have introduced in previous slides. The, in previous slides, it's just a term used to distinguish the learning or, or the final models. Um, however, what I'm going to introduce is not exactly for classification, it's for uh, generate something, not necessarily for classification. The variational autoencoder 
or VAE is one of that example. If you remember, we have demonstrated several fake faces in the lecture one, and uh, those are actually generated by such kind of uh, models. So let's see what it is. Here are two parts of the network, um, encoder and decoder respectively. So what we're doing here is trying to, um, we first in encoder, we are reducing the dimensionality of the original X you can see here. Um, um, for example, you can use the CNN to do a set convolution. After the convolution, uh, and the dimensionality will be reduced and making it compact representation for the original X. Then you can regenerate or reconstruct from this compact fe feature um, using the decoder. The decoder is, tr is trying to reconstruct the original X with this compact uh, representation uh, feature. So in the end, in hope, in the hope that this reconstructed X hat is the same as the original X. So you could see the last function here. It's actually evaluating the difference between the X hat and the X. So in that case, we're, um, we're doing this in the hope that we can reconstruct the X uh, from here. Uh, why we're doing this? The reason is if we can re we have the ability we would by training this way we will have the ability of our capacity of reconstruct uh, x or generate uh, x hat from a compact representation for example if the, here is a random noise we can generate a random noise to put them here to replace uh, those z then because the decoder is able to generate um, example from that noise, then we will generate, we, we can generate any of the examples as we want. So that's is the idea. So uh, for doing that, we could have the encoder to map X to a random noise here. So in the future, once we have a random noise, not necessarily uh, the same as uh, that from the original X, we can use a decoder to generate a new example there. This example uh, might different from the uh, images in the original data sets, but it definitely follows some of the patterns or characteristics of the original uh, images there because this is what we have learned. Um, so that's is the idea of VAE. And here is a one more specific e example. Um, uh, we have image as input using the encoder. We learn some latent attributes. Uh, here we're using different names for that compact representation. It could actually could be different types of representation. It could be random noise and it could be what uh, they put here. Those values are actually related to different characteristics of, of the original image. Then after the decoder reconstruction, we are in a hope that uh, we can reconstruct exactly the same um, example of the original image, but this is just for training. It's just for training. And after training, this decoder part is able to generate example. In that case, you can modify those value to generate new example, which follow uh, might be what you want because you have um, described the, the, their characteristics specifically here. And here is another example, uh, which actually trying to use the encoder to generate um, Gaussian distribution uh, because they're mapping them to uh, uh, Gaussian distribution. Gaussian distribution is another compact representation uh, about the original image. 
in that case in the future because we already know the Gaussian distribution we can use that distribution to generate any of this compact representation randomly and then we can use a decoder to generate uh, new examples there and as I mentioned those are uh, well be different from those examples from the original data sets but uh, the new example carries some of the characteristics we have learned into that model. Here are more examples generating by VAE. Those are real examples from papers as shown here. And actually you could see those images are kind of blur. Even it's quite impressive that we can generate uh, examples and that actually could be used for uh, music generation as well. But the quality here is not that satisfactory. In fact, VAE is not an only option. Uh, we have a later natives like the GAN, uh, which is also really popular. Um, before that, let's see the VAE is more like a training framework because you can implement them in different way. The GAN is following that sense as well. GAN is another framework uh, where um, you, the most important part for GAN is a generator and a discriminator. So it's a quite interesting idea. In the GAN, uh, it starts by generating some of the random noise. So the random noise will do something to generate some of the data. It's like the decoder part of the VAE, but it, it's, uh, it's doing this um, directly uh, for generating data. And then that generated data will be put into the discriminators. Um, the discriminator, you can consider it as a classifier. Uh, this classifier is trying to this data generated. Let's say it's a fake data and by comparing them back to the real data. So uh, this is a classifier. In that case, we will use the real data as a positive example and the data we generated with the generated uh, as the negative example there. And they are, uh, those are real and those are fake. So the output of the classifier is the fake and real. So in case um, this process will repeat uh, there, uh, uh, that means the discriminator trying to distinguish, um, uh, discriminator trying to distinguish the real uh, fake data from the real ones. At the same time, the generator is trying to fool that discriminator by giving them the fake data, and they fight to each other. They are trying to fool each other in between. So when this is doing inter uh, in iteratively so uh, they, they will improve uh, respectively during the fighting because this is trying hard to fill this one and this is trying hard to distinguish uh, the fake data from the real data and by doing this um, uh, cooperation they are actually in some sense collaborating um, to each other and they can improve their capacity at the same time. So this is a quite interesting framework. And here's an example uh, for handwritten digits. And we may have some random noise like this and we use the generator to generate fake handwriting images there. Put them into the discriminator and also at the same time, because we have some real handwritten digits images available there, we can use them for training together with those fake data. Then those discriminator will tell the difference. So at the very beginning, the generator uh, can generate some uh, no quality fake images there. So it's not easy to fool the discriminator. So that means discriminator will be easy to tell uh, they're fake. 
So this information will be considered in the loss function. And um, in that case, at the very beginning, the loss is, uh, is greater. And so this uh, greater loss will be back propagated and the information will be passed back for the generator. So the generator knows, oh, I'm not doing a good job. Um, I will try to improve um, with that loss, with that uh, gradient, descent, back propagation or something. We can update the parameters here to make it better towards um, to generating uh, more uh, like the something more like the real data. So the generator will be improved. Then by doing several rounds, the generator are be able to generate better fake data to fill the discriminator. Um, so it's a become more challenging for the discriminator there because right now the generator is generating the better data. So uh, in that case, the classification loss will help the discriminator to improve because those discrim um, classification loss will be back propagated to the neural network of the discriminator to improve. So you could see it already blade, they're fighting to each other, they're trying to fool each other, but they're improving at the same time. They are both enemies and friends at the same time. And here are some applications of GAN. You could see it generating much better data, more real data than the VAE. So that's the reason make it really popular. The GAN actually can be used for uh, zero shot learning uh, as well. Uh, it, uh, it will be something like at the training stage, we have some real examples um, like those same examples and we there we have their attributes we can put the attributes and random noise together as the input for the generator the generator will generate images the fake images um, but uh, those discriminator will compare back those fake images uh, for example the horses and um, and during that training iteratively those generator will be able to generate images uh, look like real uh, for example the real horses here with some of description so in that case when we're changing this description and this random noise it will generate different things um, to fool the discriminator so at the end it should uh, as you have seen in the example, it's, it is be able to generate those look really good uh, images there. So in the future for some unseen classes like the zebra, as I mentioned, we have their descriptions. So we could use their attributes from description together with another set of random noise as the input for the GAN generator. And it's supposed to generate some of the fake zebra. Even it's fake because the ability of the GAN generator has been improved during the training. It should be look like the real ones. So this real one can be used for the, doing the prediction for those unseen examples there. So in that case, simply saying, we don't have uh, examples for those unseen samples, but we're able to generate some of the fake uh, samples for them, which are looks like real uh, because that is coming from the GAN. Um, then we have the examples to conduct a classification problem here to solve the prediction for unseen uh, classes. Okay, we have actually introduced a lot of learning paradigms today. As I mentioned, some are frameworks, some are tasks, there some are specific models there. And here's one last thing I am going to introduce today because it's quite 
uh, important for um, a lot of machine learning problems. It's called reinforcement learning. Uh, usually, um, the reinforcement learning has been considered as one of the main learning paradigms in machine learning. Basically, they're putting something like uh, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning, something like this. So reinforcement learning is a big family of, of learning there. So uh, that's really we're picking up to give a brief introduction of them. Uh, what make the reinforcement learning different from the other two is in supervised learning, we have some training data. We are doing the prediction on, uh, on, uh, of the labels of those unseen classes, unseen examples, sorry. So in unsupervised learning, we don't need any of the training data, but we can only mine some of the characteristics from the data sets. We don't tell exactly what they are. Um, we don't give the semantically meaning for labels for each of them. Um, however, doing in reinforcement learning, it's kind of different. Uh, it's in some sense lead needs the training examples, but not exactly those uh, labeled by human being. It's automatically collected from the so-called environment. Here are some terms like the agent, like the actions, real world state interpreters. We would like to um, give you one example to explain that part. Let's see, we have a car. Um, Drawing some car there. Uh, forgive my scale of drawing. Um, so um, we have a car and we probably have a road there. And on the road, there are some obstacles. And the goal of the car is bypass those obstacles. And so, and at the same time, it will avoid to uh, bump into those walls there. So here you could see we have the car. The car is something uh, like the agent you could see. Here the car is the agent. The agent is doing something in the environment. So this whole thing, including those obstacles, uh, in, including the obstacles, including um, the walls and the roads as well are actually the environment. So this whole thing is the environment because the agents doing things in the environment and in each of the time step, the car is taking an action of, for, for example, let's simplify. The action is just to going right or going left. So these are two actions there. So uh, going right, uh, going left, that's the action. So by doing this action, um, and you will have something called the reward from the environment. For example, if I'm taking an action a right um, a too, too far, I'm going to bump into that wall or um, bump into that ob obstacle, bump into here or bump into here, and that crashes the car. So in that case, we could, the environment gave us a very no um, reward, like uh, minus 10,000. Or if we're doing right, we're not bumping into something, we collect some reward like uh, uh, like 100, okay? If we're doing right, we get this. If we are doing bad, we get a negative reward from the experiment, so uh, environment. Uh, so you could see here, we those rewards serve something like uh, labels uh, for actions because we're um, actually trying to predict which action to take using those reward 
uh, the history reward as training data. You, you could think of that way, and even it's not uh, exactly correct, but I think that concepts will help you to understand reinforcement learning. Uh, however, to uh, conduct training, we need some example. Of we we need the data of features of training that is, that is related to state. The state is actually telling the car um, its state of st the status. Um, uh, for example, we could have some sensors on the car. The sensors tell us how far. Uh, it's from the surrounding object. Let's see, there are some sensors on the car. The sensors tell our distance uh, to different obstacles at the same time. And those distance can be used as features to model the state. So those are state um, sensor uh, from sensors. So it's a feature vector. You can see here. So what we're doing is at a certain state, we are making some action, which are the action is the one we're trying to predict, which is the best action to take. So and after taking the action, we got a lot of history rewards and history feature vectors as well. We could use them for training. Um, so in this case, we don't have to label specifically for each of the action because the environment are giving labels automatically. And when the car is drawing, uh, is moving inside that environment, and this will be continuously, the information will be collected continuously and the training will be uh, down iteratively. And at the end, because this car is going to crash a lot of times, and also it's well doing good sometime to avoid um, those obstacles. And your model will learn the correlation between the states and, uh, and the action. For example, if the sensor is telling you there is a very uh, close obstacle, obstacle around, you should avoid bumping into it and you take the action to avoid bump, bumping into it. So. And let's repeat that process. This is a typical application of reinforcement learning. Uh, as we're just a beginner's course, we um, I'm not going to give more details to confuse you. And here is one example. Actually, it's available on the internet. You can download it and try it yourself. And what we're doing. Here can you can actually doing do it in different way. For example, you could have very specific information about the environment here, and uh, you do the prediction or build uh, state data from here uh, about which lines you're in, how many cars around, and so on and so forth. Or Another option is you don't have to rely on those sensor data. You can go uh, directly with the image because uh, before you taking any action, you have the image available. The image tells a lot of information. You don't have to tell um, um, exactly like the distances to obstacles, you can mine, you can figure it out from that images as well. Um, so uh, for example, that might remind you about Tesla, uh, which relies on the RTP cameras only. So they are using the pictures directly. They don't actually use those um, exact uh, sensor data. Um, so there are actually two different ways of doing that. And um, so in that case, because we're uh, uh, teaching computer vision, this is one way or a more computer vision like the way using the image directly as the state, uh, the, the source for state estimation. Okay, um, that's it. That's a reinforcement learning. Actually, uh, we got a lot of learnings in between. And as mentioned, we're just a beginner's course. We're not going to confuse you. 
if you're interested and uh, trying to find more papers about different learning paradigms we have introduced today to get more details. Okay, thank you very much. That's all for today.